Thank you for that music. Do you appreciate that choir? Let's give them another good hand of welcome. Thank God. Praise God. The book of Proverbs, chapter 4, if you have it, if you'll turn in there with me. I want to minister uh, for a few minutes from this passage of Scripture. We are a Pentecostal movement. Some of you aren't, I can tell. I was getting my hair cut last week, and uh, a little lady who was cutting my hair said, uh, uh, what do you do? I said, I'm the pastor of the Potter's House. She said, oh, Pentecostal? I said, yes, Pentecostal. She said, oh, I attended a service there for a wedding of a little beautician, and she said, I told my mother that uh, when they pray, they pray all at once, and they all speak in tongues, and uh, and uh, so I said, yes, that's what we are. We are Pentecostal. Yes. At least we know how to pray. Yes. Can you say amen? Yes. Three books that you need to get. One of these books is Signs and Wonders. Why Pentecostalism is the fastest growing faith by Paul Alexander. The second one is To the Ends of the Earth. This is Pentecostalism and the Transformation of World Christianity by Anderson, put out by Oxford. And the third one is Chinese Road by Robert Griffith. You need to get that. You need to read that because this is an outstanding book. Then there's another little book that they're going to have in the book room. It's a little red book. It's Obama. Uh, Barack Obama's Rules for Revolution. Those are for a dollar. That's a bargain. Anybody can read it very quick. This is the Alinsky model by David Horowitz. It'll tell you why that you're seeing what's going on in America today. And so a little plug there just to uh, get, get you along, get you wound up for the conference. Amen. <laughs> we have as a theme uh, uh, serving God in our generation. And uh, this uh, theme is the, out of the book of Acts, and it is the statement of, God, of God's about, about uh, David. David served his generation by the will of God. Now, I want to preach tonight about knowing the will of God. There probably is no other subject about which more books are written and more uh, content is brought forward than how to know the will of God for yourself. There's no, this is not a simple subject. This uh, number of dimensions that are there, this uh, quote by uh, the scripture that David served his generation by the will of God. One verse, Proverbs 4 and verse, eight, uh, verse 18, if you'll follow there with me for a moment. Uh, the Bible says in the King James, uh, that the path of the just is as a shining light that shines more and more under the coming day. New King James says, but the path of the just is like the shining sun that shines ever brighter under the perfect day. I want to preach to you tonight about knowing the will of God. Now, this is life's great dilemma tonight, uh, which is to understand and know the will of God. And uh, there is a quest tonight for... Uh, we might call that divination. And uh, this quest is to know the future. What is coming tomorrow? And it was uh, Saul who made the mistake uh, of going to the witch of Ender so that he could find out what's going to happen on the morrow. And this was the great curse uh, that uh, damned him, uh, the final act of God cutting him off uh, totally. I was in Bible school many years ago. And uh, there was numbers of the Bible students, and the, uh, the, the uh, word was going around. That there was a man, in, a pastor in Long Beach, California. You could go to him, and uh, you could uh, tape, take your own tape. And this is in the days of rolls before the modern technology. And uh, you would stand before him, and this man would prophesy over you, this was a very popular thing. Many people were making their way down there and getting that word so that they could 
find out what's going to happen tomorrow, what is going to be the word that they're going to get, because in the human heart is this, uh, this quest for knowing the future. Can you say amen? So in this passage of Scripture we have, we have a word, and that word is called the path. This has to do with direction. It has to do with marriage. It has to do with your career. It has to do with your ministry. And in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 30, and verse 19, says, I call heaven and earth as witness today that I will have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. So here we have this statement, and the Bible says, you must choose. Dwayne Renz preached about a fork in the road. So here as you're sitting here in this conference tonight, I want to bring this to the forefront to you because we're talking about the will of God and the problem is how do you discern what is the uh, will of God? We live in a spiritual arena tonight. In this spiritual arena is the world, the flesh, and the devil. All of these dimensions are at work in this spiritual arena. And uh, there's an ancient admonition that we want to make sure that we do not seek direction uh, by divination, uh, but we have, have direction from God. Listen to Deuteronomy chapter 18. When you come into the land uh, your God is giving you, you do not learn to imitate uh, the detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, uh, for or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist, uh, or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things uh, is detestable to the Lord. Now, we're not against uh, people getting a word from an evangelist, getting a word from God. But looking back on my life, Thank God when I went to Bible school, I was too busy making a living for my family and serving God and teaching in the local church and serving God. I didn't have time to go down to this man because in retrospect, uh, I'm going to tell you there's lots of kinky stuff that goes on in the world in which we live. Can you say amen? I got a four-page letter today. Our congregation did a outreach at uh, Elks Theater. And this man was there. Somebody witnessed to him as in the audience. He said it was a wonderful presentation. But a man asked, are you born again? And so he responded back uh, and uh, smarted off. And the man just left him. Uh, he could tell he's a nut, so he left him alone. And so I get a four-page letter. This man is detailing that he's into uh, time travel, you know. And so he's explaining all these dimensions of time. How many of you know there's a lot of nuts running loose in the world? I mean, <laughs> And I, I faxed it to Greg along with a note, and I said, thank God we know that we're in revival, we're, that we're in revival when the nuts start coming out of the woodwork. That's a sure sign we're in revival. So let's ponder this, menace, uh, this uh, uh, subject for a moment, because here's life's greatest dilemma. How do you know the, live, uh, the, the uh, will of God, uh, or in other words, guidance or direction? That's what Deuteronomy is talking about. Uh, and daily, each of us have issues and we have choices to make. Uh, James uh, said, every man is led aside of his own lust. Uh, and Paul talks about uh, that deceiver who blinds uh, the mind. So let's ponder this business of the will of God for a moment because this is in our conference theme. Uh, David uh, served his generation by the will of God. John addresses this with a warning. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, uh, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world's passing away, listen, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God uh, abides uh, forever. It is James uh, who says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally and does not upbraid, and it shall be given him. 
How many of you know that God is willing to give you the path that, that he wants you to walk, walk on? And these conferences uh, are intended and aimed uh, to engage uh, this issue as we're here. Our conferences are not like other conferences. Our conferences deliberately home in on and get a dead eye on every pastor. Amen. We want pastors to answer altar calls. Say, pastors, answer altar call. If we could get every pastor to answer an altar call for what God was dealing with him about, we'd have automatic revival overnight if they would do the will of God. Can you say amen? You might as well say amen. If you can't say, oh, me, amen. <laughs> so this is the challenge tonight is to surrender to the calling of God, and we want to talk about that path uh, for a moment tonight. Now, this is an evolving dimension, and I said uh, that this is no simple answer. Sometimes there are some complicated factors that are involved in this, uh, and the great mistake is uh, that we're not going to take any kind of action uh, unless we have a supernatural uh, direction from God. Uh, there's going to be a personal word, or there's going to be a vision, or there's going to be a, vo a voice. Years ago, I was sitting at a Bible conference. I'm sitting listening to this preacher, and his whole sermon was uh, that you, and he was not a pastor, he was just preaching in the country, that the whole thing was you should not move or do anything unless you have an angelic visitation, unless you hear a voice from God, unless you hear, uh, un unless you hear a, a voice uh, or something. And I'm sitting there watching this man, and I said to myself, that man's called of God, and he's fighting that call with all that was in him. I could read him like a book, amen. So let's look for a moment uh, at this. Uh, I have an article that I clipped out. Some, uh, it's a, it's a st statement about a man uh, who got sucked into the new age. And without uh, going into details, he uh, is uh, uh, in his, an association with a woman, uh, and this woman is involved in the new age and the occult. And she says, uh, uh, you have uh, something uh, above your head there. It's a light, and uh, that light is there beings in another world and they're trying to uh they're trying to speak to you and you have a lot of help on the other side and to cut a long story short he prays what he was called the reverse sinner's prayer and he opens and says uh, all of you out there uh, come in and help me and sure enough they did because there's a uh, lots of them out there amen <laughs> but they're not from god so let's think for a moment if you're a mormon today why, as soon as you're finished converting to Mormonism, they say, now you need to pray that you get a testimony. Now, a testimony to a Mormon is that a dead aunt or an uncle or somebody that's already there will appear to them, and as they appear to them, will confer. You're on the right road. You made the right decision about Mormonism. I have news for you. There's lots of wugums in the world just waiting to confirm a life from hell. Can you say amen? But you and I are looking for the will of God. Can you say amen? Thank God. So look at this for a moment with me. Because here is a biblical truth, uh, and that biblical truth says that this uh, brighter light that God shines, uh, and he uses an analogy of the sun coming up, grows uh, more and more, or brighter and brighter, brighter unto the coming day. So here is an interesting thing about the will of God. Much of the will of God uh, does not immediately appear. It appears when you make right decisions uh, in life, uh, having to do with morals, uh, having to do with relationship, having to do with money, as Pastor Camel said tonight. Uh, but as you obey in those things, uh, the path grows brighter and brighter and brighter as the sun coming up uh, in the morning. We have a man named Abraham in the Bible. Abraham uh, is uh, needing a son for his, uh, for a wife for his son Isaac. And so he sends his servant up to Haran in Turkey. And it's very interesting, the testimony that's given about that. Genesis 24 and 27, he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who's not forsaken his mercy and his truth toward my master. As for me, being on the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. 
Now, here's an interesting thing about getting direction from God. God guides those uh, who are on the move. If you're sitting there tonight and you're saying, uh, well, if God visits me with an angel, uh, it'll be fine. If I hear a voice, well, you may wait a long, long time uh, because God's speaking to you tonight and he's speaking to you through my mouth. Uh, and if you'll open your heart, you'll hear it and you'll obey God and you'll have a victory before you leave this service tonight. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 14 and verse 6. Jonathan said to his young uh, armor bearer, Come, let us go over to the outpost of these uncircumcised fellow. Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Now here's a tremendous truth. God didn't say to Jonathan, what you need to do is gather your armor bearer and go over. But Jonathan knew that God is looking for people who get in motion for him. Thank God for that. Can you say amen? Listen to what I said again. God manifests himself to people who get in motion for him. And you can read the history. A tremendous victory was done for God. Abraham is the father of our faith. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, Abraham went out not knowing where he was going. Now I want to tell you that is nervous business. Can you say amen? But I want to tell you God's nudging people tonight. And if you will be responsive to God, this week will end with you walking into the will of God and doing the will of God, which doesn't seem all that plain at the moment, but it will. Acts 15, verse 26. Our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here we have it for a moment. And this is the evolving dimension of how you walk in the will of God is first of all, you get in motion and God's gonna put you in motion this week. Someone made a tremendous statement. They're talking about success and uh, said, uh, uh, how, do you, uh, how, how do you exceed? How, do you, how are you gonna uh, have success? Said, when opportunity knocks, uh, you have to jump. They said, but how do you know if it's the right opportunity? And the answer said, you don't, you just have to keep jumping. <laughs> now, I know there's some of you here, you're just super spiritual and uh, you, God tells you uh, what kind of cereal to have uh, every morning. But some of us are just common folks. Uh, and we serve God and God wonderfully blesses us because we just get in motion because we know that's what we ought to do. Can you say amen? Uh, and so as we look at this for a moment, uh, you can look tonight and see what God has done in Prescott. When my wife and I came to Prescott, Arizona, we did not have some fantastic apparition. We didn't have somebody appear, a great uncle that had died and say, this is the right place. We uh, came to a church we knew that was damaged desperately. And uh, as we came here, uh, it had been hurt by moral failure. And we knew that there were two families that were here in the church. Uh, and we said to ourselves, uh, if these two families stay, let's take this church. And we came over. It just felt right uh, to do that. Uh, and those families were the Copeland and Allen families. Uh, and God uh, gloriously moved. Uh, and the rest is history. Can you say amen? As we moved along a little bit further, we got uh, triggered with the Jesus movement. Uh, many people think that the reason that we have this ministry, I saw this fantastic panorama, and God said, if you'll do this and if you'll do that, I don't have the slightest clue what we're doing. I just want to serve God. We started a concert ministry, and the choice was between starting a concert ministry when we begin to reach hippies or start a commune. Now, at that period of time, communes were very popular. Hippies were living together, some of them in the forest, and so on and so forth. And so we made a decision, and that decision was rather than do a commune ministry, we're going to do a concert ministry, and that was the hand of God, and only history has written that this evolved an evolving dimension, and we can talk about church planting. 
The first church we planted was after we'd done some tremendous outreach in Baghdad, Arizona. It's known here locally as Gagbad. I don't know what the population is, a little mining town, maybe 2,500, I don't really know. We did outreaches there, but it come time when we're going to plant a church, and so we're looking for a metropolis where we can find a, a wonderful opportunity, and we chose Wickenburg, Arizona, 1,500 people, and we took a rock musician, uh, put him in a cowboy town. I mean, that's so, that's, that's so wise. I mean, that absolutely, you do that all the time. But to our astonishment, uh, in seven months, he was self-supporting. Uh, and so our ministry began to evolve uh, because the will of God doesn't appear as a panorama. The will of God sometimes is just step by step uh, as you do what you feel God is wanting you to do. And this is the evolving dimension of the will of God. So quickly now, I want to move you to the deciding factor tonight. Here's the crucial issue, and the key to success is not methodology. Many people make the mistake, if I had the right method, if I just had the right uh, program, they travel to conferences all over planet Earth, all over, uh, all over the uh, United States of America. They buy books of every kind. Uh, they travel and attend conferences and hot spots here and hot spots there. Uh, and they buy books and fantastic claims are made about this and made about that. And the Toronto and the Brownville and the Tampa and uh, supernatural paranormal things. Uh, gold dust is falling. We never had any gold dust here ever, a single bit of gold dust. Uh, Doves are flying out of people's sleeves uh, and all these fantastic claims. Uh, and here we are, just clods, just plodding along. And God has broken in upon us uh, with his wonderful blessing. So here's the defining fa deciding factor. Follow with me. There's a, no moral, there's a moral element that is involved. Look at the words that I read. The path of the just uh, is as the shining light that shines more and more unto the coming day. Or the path, uh, the New King James says, of the righteous uh, is uh, as the sun that shines brighter and brighter unto the coming day. Uh, so here we have a principle. This principle is if you want to know and do the will of God, there is a moral dimension uh, that is involved uh, and that is very, very important. Not just a bunch of people involved in religious activity. Can you say amen? There is a moral dimension. And if your heart is right, you can depend. God will help you to find his will. When we did our first big outreach, it was at the Boys Club, which was an old junior high school that was used for community events. And uh, we did that. It was a great success. I, I was turned on because I was a product of the denominational world. And I called a friend of mine uh, in Kingman, Arizona. I said, you've got to come down here and you've got to see what God's doing with hippies. Uh, and uh, he and his wife came down uh, and they saw that. Uh, and somehow what I saw, they did not see. They were turned off. I'm not sure all that went through their minds. Perhaps they saw some of these young people, dirty, long-haired, uh, might have been a few of them outside smoking, who knows. I'm not too sure that some of them were high that night. But at any rate, uh, what I saw and what I felt, they did not see, and they missed God a million miles. The first big outreach we did with an impact team we went to my old home church in Phoenix, Arizona, took 75 people on an impact team and evangelized, passed out track, did a concert that night with Eden. As we did that concert, I have a niece was in that. And as I walked by, is the, about 75 raw sinners. One of them was Jesus. He walked in with a long robe, you know, as he walked in. One, one guy had a Levi jacket and he had a rifle action on it. I mean, they're barefooted, they're dirty, they're long haired. And one of my nieces said, uh, Wayman, I sure hope you know what you're doing. <laughs> so listen to me for a moment, because what we're dealing with tonight is a moral element uh, and a moral dimension. Uh, 
And you will never know the will of God until you surrender to the will of God. You're saying to me tonight, Pastor Mitch, you tell me what the will of God is. I'll do it. No, you surrender, and then God will tell you what his will is. In the book of John, chapter 7, great mistake made right there. Many people are sitting. There's people sitting right here tonight. You're sitting here, and you came to this conference, uh, and you're saying, uh, if God will show me his will, I'm going to do it. And God's saying to you, no, first of all, you surrender. Then I'll show you. John 7, verse 17. Listen to these verses. Uh, as the scripture says, if anyone wills uh, to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak of my own authority. Or in other words, one translation says, if anyone wants to do the will of God. Another translation says, if anyone chooses to do the will of God. And another says, uh, anyone who is willing to keep on doing the will of God. So here we have the key. When the apostle Paul was knocked off of his beast of burden on the Damascus road, the first words that came out of his mouth was, Lord, what do you want me to do? That's surrendering to the will of God. Isn't that profound? I mean, you came tonight to hear the most profound things. You're going to come here. Here's this conference and this profound thing. Pastor Mitchell is going to preach us this profound. Sir. That's profound. Lord, what do you want me to do? Three days he's without sight. He winds up in the house of Ananias and who was told to come and pray for him, Acts 9, 16. And God spoke to Ananias and said, Go, for he's a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. You see, it is as you continue with your heart right, there's a moral dimension. That moral dimension is very powerful. It's an attitude that you're going to serve God that brings guidance. I told this story before, probably in a conference. We've got a few people who never heard it before. Many years ago, we were reaching a number of people. I felt totally incapable of myself uh, of giving direction to the wonderful revival that God was giving us. I don't know how many people were running, probably 300 people. And so I thought to myself, what I ought to do is I ought to resign, I ought to go off somewhere else and let somebody come in that is uh, capable of understanding and doing what is there. I had two friends. They were pastors. They said to me, there's a prophetess in Oklahoma. And if you call her, she will know exactly what you need and she can give you some direction. They gave me the phone number. I made the call. When I made that call, I didn't have to tell this woman anything. The spirit that was in her knew exactly what I was calling for. And she said to me over the phone, no, you're not going to be able to stay there. You go ahead and you go on. God's going to take care of you and things will be all right. And he understands. And inside of me is the spirit of God living. I wanted to do the will of God. Can you say amen? I sincerely wanted to obey God. My heart was right. I wasn't living in sin. I wasn't spending my time watching porno, amen. And inside of me is a voice that says, that's not me speaking. That is a demonic spirit that sought to derail the very thing that God was wanting to do. And Psalm 16, verse 11 says, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Fast forward just a little bit. I'm praying on the platform one morning, and God is clear as I'm speaking here, but I, it wasn't an audible voice, uh, spoke one word into my spirit, Nogales. Now, I had this, not the slightest clue anything about Nogales. The only thing I knew about Nogales is that the only guy I ever knew that did dope when I was in high school uh, had moved up from Nogales and he smoked pot. That's all I knew about Nogales. Out of that, uh, 
I went and did a little survey with my family. We took off from Monday through Friday, went down to Nogales. Uh, we went below the border, went through the gate, uh, and everything's in Spanish. There's uh, uh, brown-skinned people speaking another language. I am terrified. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I'm terrified. This is a foreign land, uh, and I'm a white, honky American. <laughs> we turned around and went back across. Uh, but out of that impression from God, if my heart was right, uh, we did open uh, a work in Nogales, a little building, 15 by 30 uh, foot, uh, with a concert with uh, uh, Eden, and God powerfully moved in one of the most powerful church planting cities uh, in the world, is in Nogales, or Mexico. Can you say amen? <laughs> now, let me bring this to conclusion this morning. We are in this place tonight, uh, and we have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. I told you to get a book, every pastor. You need to read this book. It's called China Road by Robert Griffith. He starts out in Shanghai, China. He's going to travel Road 312 to the border, and he's stopping and uh, he's doing interviews with the people to get a feel. He is a uh, reporter for NPR out of England. He is doing interviews with all these people, uh, and he writes in this book, and bear with me for a moment, because this is one of the most powerful statements that I have ever read, and I hope it grasps your heart like it grasps mine. He's standing at the grave of Hudson Taylor in China. Hudson Taylor was a Chinese missionary, gave his life, and he's buried in China. He's standing at the grave, and as he's standing at the grave, he's reflecting that at one time in his life, he felt that he might be called to be a pastor and a minister. He went to his pastor. As he went to his pastor and told him that, uh, the pastor says to him, listen to me, pastor. The Bible says we should not be many teachers uh, because we're going to be brought to a far greater judgment uh, than others. Listen to carefully to what I'm saying. He went to his pastor, and his pastor said, well, I think that sort of canvas might prove a little small for you. I remember his words uh, Exactly. He's standing at the grave of Hudson Taylor. I remember his words exactly. They surprised me because I'd always thought that the human soul was as large a canvas as you could find. He didn't become a pastor. His life took another turn. So here he is now. He's reflecting on these events. He says, in the flow of my life, change completely. But like your first love, you never really forget your first hero, nor do you ever forget the road not taken. I often look back at the fork in the road at which I stood and the choice I made and what might have been. And I stand for a very long time that hot summer day just looking at the tombstone of James Hudson Taylor. I think about the road not taken. I reflect upon that and what might have been. He travels on this road 312, Highway 312, and they come to a place of a little church, a little Chinese church. He decides he wants to go to church. He tells the driver to wait for him. He goes into that church and there's about 40 people there, converses. He's spent numbers of years in China. He's very fluent in Chinese. He knows the nation of China. He has a handle on exactly what's going on in China. He sees the changes that have come, and as he's there, an elderly woman converses with him, and he goes in, and they're waiting for an itinerant pastor. They don't have a regular pastor. He preaches there in several other places, and they're waiting for him. He doesn't show up. Finally, they turn to him and say, uh, you, 
ocean person. He's the only white person. They call him ocean person. You, you're going to bring the scripture today. No, no, I'm not a pastor. I've never been to seminary. No, I can't do that. They won't be denied. They all rise up and say, no, no, you are going to bring the message today. He gets a Chinese Bible. He reads John 14, verse 6. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes into the Father except by me. An overwhelming response of these people. Now think about this. He's in China now. He can feel the pulse beat of that country. It's not at all what you think it is. Uh, the Communist Party is in charge, uh, but they hate them. He's writing about the opportunities. He's now reflecting back. He's come to Hudson Taylor's ta grave. He's reflecting back now. He sees uh, the tremendous opportunities now that is in China. He's taken a different road. As he stands and looks at that grave, uh, and he feels the pulse beat of the 1.3 billion people that are in China, it's brought home to him what might have been. I want every head bowed. I want every eye closed.